Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast, talking all things movement, whole food nutrition and environmental wellness with your hosts, Ben and Emma. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 21. My name is Ben Alderberg coming to you from Auckland and Emma Strutt from Boona. Back home, Emma, hello. G'day, g'day. How are you going, Ben? Very good. Glad you've got your voice back. Yeah. Um, I know some of our listeners may have wondered why was Emma so quiet in our last episode? Well, I'll tell you why. She was having coughing fits in the background, so <laughs> she decided to to remain pretty quiet. But she's back, which is awesome. Um, and let's get straight into it. Emma, our next guest. All right. So we've got Shane Ward joining us today, um, and he's actually the third guest that's linked up with the Better Futures Forum. Shane is founder of Action Ecology, a consultancy providing regenerative land use advice. Shane is an expert on soil health and sustainable land use. He's a speaker, teacher and master communicator who's passionate about sustainable food production, ecosystem restoration, plant and soil ecology and the design of closed loop systems. So I think we're in for a treat today. Um, Shane, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks very much for having me. That was a a glowing introduction. (laughs) Hopefully I can live up to some of that. No pressure, Shane. Now, Shane, um, (laughs) to our listeners, I mentioned I attended a uh, presentation a few weeks ago and uh, alongside Mike Joy, you were one of the other fantastic guests that I promised our listeners that we were going to uh, lure onto the show. So thank you very much for coming on. Um, you had 20 minutes then, you rushed through a whole bunch of stuff. You've got more time so we can go into a little bit more detail, explain a little bit more about some of the concepts you mentioned. But to kick off, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, offline, we we're talking about where you've lived, where you've been. Tell us a little bit about your, um, you know, your journey and, and I guess your interest in the world of ecology. Sure. Um, well, I guess um, to start at the beginning, I, I mean, I grew up um, in sort of on the outskirts of Melbourne, um, where the suburbs met the bush, um, on a, a few acres uh, in a mud brick house, surrounded by trees, and uh, I guess that probably left a lasting impression on me. In so far as I spent the vast majority of my time out there, you know, playing, climbing trees out outside. Um, and you know, uh, after finishing uh, school and a bit of uni and a bit of work and so forth, I left Australia and um, I went to Europe. Uh, I had spent some time actually growing up in France as well. My family's um, mostly French, and um, so I was kind of eager to get back over there and sort of reconnect with that side. Um, and I ended up um, staying. So, I mean, I was living um, in London. I lived a bit in France, but in Mexico where I had a house for a while um, and various other places, did a lot of travelling. Um, and after, I guess, sort of two other careers, um, first in film and television and then uh, in corporate communications, I found myself... I guess, coming back towards what really excited me and, and motivated me as a person and, and that sort of connection with the natural world. Um, and, I, you know, I wanted to understand what does it mean to, I guess, to have to have that real connection, especially after living for so long in such a big city um, as London. And also, you know, what... It, can we live sustainably on this planet? I mean, I guess that was really the, the, the question which got me. You know, I was, I was becoming more and more aware of this. And I wanted to know not just could we do a little bit better, but could we actually succeed? You know, like could, could as, a, as a species, could we actually exist on this planet in a way that was truly sustainable, that we could do forever? And I, I guess I got kind of... A bit obsessed with the question and trying to find out whether that was possible or not and actually it was a bit harder than you might think because when you go out there and you look at you know all the great ideas for things that we can do a lot of them are just focused for doing better and don't concern themselves with actually answering that fundamental question of if it's actually possible for us to exist on this planet in a sustainable way so that um you know long story short i managed to find out the answer is yes and that once you realize that that kind of changes everything. I mean, you know, it 
it makes you, you know, made me then wonder, okay, well, how? What does that look like? What, what's involved? What, you know, what are the things that that allow us to exist within those planetary limits, and what are the things which tip us over that line? Um, and that sort of led me on to things like permaculture uh, and so on and so forth. And that sort of set the dominoes rolling in terms of my my um, training and uh, studying and learning about you know how we actually do that. And I think that's where why a lot of us find ourselves here, you know, on the podcast. Well, Emma and myself, but also a lot of our listeners is, I guess, you get to a point where you start appreciating more what's around you. And I think what's also happening in the last couple of decades is change has accelerated so much that we're also, um, you know, you might have driven through an area that was bush. Um, or actually, if I relate to me growing up back in South Africa, sugarcane plantations. You know, I used to ride through rows that was just sugarcane plantations. And then 10 years later, it's just housing. You know, where did that come from? Um, so you start to question the whole, is this sustainable? You know, what's the impact on how we're feeding everyone? What's the impact on roads and infrastructure and, and, and transport? What's the, infra- uh, the, the impact on uh, sewerage and, and, you know, supply of water? So, yeah, I think, I think it gets to a point where we start to realize, hang on, <laughs> what we're doing is having an impact, but now is this, is this positive? But I think the reality nowadays in 2020 is we can't wait anymore. We now need to get on top of it. We need to get ahead of it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the question perhaps um, is, you know, not if we can avert it, because I think we're probably committed already to some serious consequences uh, for us as a species you know and for a lot of other species as well um but really you know can we turn things around quick enough that we avoid the worst um you know many people have pointed out that you know i think it's nine out of 15 of the global climate um, or plant sorry nine out of 15 of the planetary tipping points have already been activated Mm. so the question now is not really can we avert um, these these consequences, but rather, can we do enough to turn it around before it's really, really bad? Um, you know, the the fact that we have over one million species at risk of extinction. You know, one in five plant species. Um, you know, ecosystem. Pretty much every ecosystem that you can name uh, under threat. You know. All of that stuff; um, those things are bad enough in and of themselves. But of course, we are critically dependent upon them. And in some ways, the the funny thing that I find myself in a position having to constantly remind people about is that we are not independent from those systems. We are dependent upon them. Mm. We everything that we have is only been possible because of those things. But we've somehow sort of gotten so caught up in it. That we've forgotten where we've come from, mm-hmm. um, and we think that we, you know, can sort of live in this little technological bubble. And it's, I can understand why people feel that way because I mean, I used to feel that way too. I just didn't make those connections. So it's not that I blame people for thinking that. It's just that I find it odd that once you realise it, um, you reconnect back with that. You 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 understand and you realise how connected we are. You think it's sort of perverse that we ha- how quickly we've been able to forget how dependent we are on all these things that we are destroying. Um, And obviously that can only end one way. Yeah, so very important to kind of really drive home that we're part of the system, we're not above it. An ecosystem. And we depend on the system to be living. So We are part of the ecosystem. We are part of the broader biosphere. We're also part of our own individual, sorry. We are also part of our own local ecosystems you know we are very obviously prominent actors in in those ecosystems we engineer those ecosystems we modify them and you talk about the nine um planetary boundaries that we've uh i guess activated but two if not three have already been we're already in the red zone aren't we so it's phosphorus nitrates you know we just haven't we haven't just activated we've actually already started going into beyond um i guess not a point of no return but you know, we've exceeded the, mm. some of those limits. Yeah, already. well, 
the the you're right about the limits absolutely i mean i think what i was referring to more specifically though was the tipping points that mm, right um, yeah have. so things like for example melting um arctic permafrost and uh thawing of glaciers or uh, sheet ice um etc cetera, etc cetera. those are things at which point so see so those are things whereby once you reach a certain level they become what we call a positive feedback loop. So these these things start you they become runaway. So you know you start melting Arctic permafrost, that increases warming, which encourages more melting of Arctic permafrost. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. so these at a certain point, we can't do anything about that anymore. We tip it, but once you tip over that first domino, you can't take it back. And and so this is why climate scientists are so alarmed and why the um, calls to do something have become so much more urgent over the last few years because there is this recognition and there's just, you know, an enormous mounting pile of evidence showing that if we breach some of these thresholds, we can't just say, oops, I'm sorry, and fix it. These, these cannot be fixed. Once we start those things, that's it. It's out of our hands. At that point, all we have left to do in regards to those processes is sort of try and prepare for the worst or, re or reduce the amount of damage, right? So that's why it's so important that we don't exceed those thresholds. Mm. Um, and, and they're all different. And it's extremely difficult to be able to say precisely where they are because these are extremely complex systems and they're connected to everything else. We've got a pretty good idea um, but the point is not really, you know, whether it's point this or point that. That the point is, in fact, that we we have an idea of where those areas are, of when we start getting really dangerously close, and we must stay away from them. Um, and yeah, so when we talk, and, and of course, you know, climate, the warming of the climate, the breakdown of our climatic systems, our ocean currents, and all this kind of stuff are, uh, you know, hugely problematic because they then exacerbate everything else. Um, but for some reason, there does seem to be quite a lot of inertia. Yeah. So so that kind of um, flows into what you do in your role at Action Ecology. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and the ways you're kind of combating these issues? Sure. I mean, I, I think the more I think about it, the more I've come to the realisation that Action Ecology is ultimately about connecting people with knowledge. And, and I do that in different ways or different levels. Um, sometimes it might be working with a, a farmer or a, a landowner, land manager somewhere um, who may have a specific problem or they want to know how they can do better. Um, it could be someone who's got a piece of land and they want to know how they can be self-sufficient. Um, it could be any particular situation where they feel they'd really like to understand how they can work with their landscape better, how they can understand the ecosystem processes that are going on and how they can change what they're doing or how they're doing it so that their land gets better over time, not worse. And I try and provide my own knowledge or connect them with stuff that I know other people are really fantastic at, uh, the latest research, um, you know, examples of best practice all around the world. I mean, the regenerative, in the regenerative agriculture space, there is, you know, all kinds of amazing and wonderful things being done all around the world. You know, pioneers, farmers on the ground, innovating in this space and discovering new stuff all the time. And, and I think, you know, it's really important to understand what the scientific literature is telling us, what the latest research is showing, um, but also to appreciate that in this particular area, the... The innovation is really actually happening out on the farms. It's not happening in the labs. So to some degree, the um, academic research is lagging behind in some ways. That's not to say that what's actually happening isn't understood by science. I mean, if you have trained as an ecologist, um, then you can recognise why these things are working the way that they are. But 
it's just to point out that, you know, some of the data collection and the sort of more detailed activity around documenting and structuring experiments around that kind of thing in the field haven't been done yet, or, or only very few have been done. But um, I suppose the, the other key thing that I do is um, communicate publicly, you know, do things like this, give talks like you saw, Ben. And um, again, it's about connecting people with knowledge. I guess I just try to do whatever I can that's helpful to, to help people understand that in order for us to have a permanent society, um, we need to have a permanent agriculture. That there, there is no other way around that. Yeah. So let's deep dive into the whole topic of farming um, and in particular intensive farming, winter grazing. So a lot of the, the issues that are rising out of that, the effect on biodiversity, water quality, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I'll let you kick that off and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into, <laughs> into this conversation. But yeah, what, 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 what are we not seeing as a day-to-day -day person goes to the supermarket, picks, picks a product off the shelf um, and not realizing how it got there? So the problem is that the way that we produce food for the most part, um, is in a way that we refer to as industrial agriculture. What we mean by that is it uses a lot of um, chemicals, so synthetic nitrogen. Um, we uh, see a lot of uh, biocides, such as insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, etc. Um, a lot of irrigation, uh, a lot of mechanisation, um, so, you know, the, the machines use a lot of uh, fossil fuels, you know, the synthetic nitrogen fertiliser is an extremely um, energy costly process to produce. And all of this um, is in the sort of service of trying to produce as much food as efficiently as possible and as cheaply as possible. Um, a large part of this is driven by the in the retail space, certainly the supermarket food system. Um, but, you know, more broadly speaking, this sort of food commodity markets are, you know, often what we would sort of call relatively you know, low price. It's not like, you know, when you go to a, your local food market, you buy a sort of, you know, artisanally produced honey or something, you know, you, you're paying more for that than, you know, a soybean that's been produced on, you know, a thousand hectares that's been laser levelled and, you know, combine harvested and all that sort of stuff. Um, so there are kind of different ends of this food producing spectrum. The problem that we have is that when you take a landscape and you look at it in terms of, well, how can I achieve the highest yield possible? then what that then results in is what you tend to see whenever you go to a large-scale industrial agriculture area. You'll see lots of square lines. Everything is set up to work around things like machinery. Um, you have to start using lots of uh, fertiliser inputs and other uh, nutrients, um, you have to manage all your pests with poisons um, and, and you need to sort of reduce or um, simplify everything in that landscape to be as straightforward and uncomplicated as possible. Because natural systems are messy insofar as there's lots of different things going on, there's lots of species, uh, they're all doing different things at different times and they're not necessarily what we would call optimal from a production point of view. So, of course, you want to get rid of all that unnecessary complication and you want to make everything as simple and as profitable as you can, which tends to be also this process of taking people off the land uh, and putting as much mechanisation in as possible. So that's the kind of industrial approach. You have a pattern that you impose upon the landscape, uh, you know, and that pattern could be, yeah, I'm, I'm growing row crops or I'm going to... Um, be growing tree crops or I'm going to be uh, grazing for uh, grazing livestock for beef or for dairy or whatever but there is a there is a kind of um, a pattern if you will a sort of a an organizing idea of how you can do that which is very industrial it's like a production line 
that's then imposed upon the landscape and you and in, in extreme examples you know you literally will get out you know bulldozers and t and change the shape of the landscape in order to make that make that fit so what happens as a result of that is you destroy biodiversity you destroy soils which are a living ecosystem through the use of all these um, inputs and poisons as well as plowing and things like that you because you're destroying the soil life you end up destroying the soil structure which means that you then need to of course supplement with all those things that we mentioned as well as you know often irrigate because you know your water holding capacity isn't as good anymore um, you've got obviously big biodiversity issues because you are you've taken what was i guess once a fairly diverse ecosystem in some cases extremely diverse ecosystem and you've simplified it down to sort of one or two species um, this also of course is all releasing co2 into the atmosphere through the oxidization of soils or you know the burning of fossil fuels etc cetera, etc cetera. and as a result you end up causing pollution into the local waterways uh, often drawing up more water out of the aquifers than is being put in there and that results in a sort of situation where the people operating the land or producing food off the land in this way um, are privatizing the profits if any because often a lot of these systems are propped up by subsidies and depending on where you are um, but then socializing the costs so the pollution that runs into the waterways from nitrate or whatever um, the farmer the producer doesn't pay for that that's the taxpayer you know if it gets cleaned up it's the taxpayer that pays for that um, same for biodiversity loss same for all that you know the erosion uh, the loss of topsoil etc cetera, etc cetera. so in a way what we end up with is a situation where the industrial approach to managing land creates the problems which it then of course tries to solve by just doubling down so if you destroy the natural cycling of nutrients in your soil which is which is done in, in a natural ecosystem is done by microbes uh, in combination with plants if you destroy that through plow and you know nitrate etc you then find that you need to put more fertilizer on to get anything to grow which kills more which then requires more and so you see that we get into this cycle it's a bit like crack for plants basically you know <laughs> um so and it's you know it's the same with the erosion the more the more you damage the soil the more it washes away um the more that soil starts to become the way that it is viewed in this system which is essentially just something lifeless that keeps plants upright and soaks up nutrients um because you've you know by doing that you've, you've killed all the life in the soil so your topsoil runs off again you don't pay for that but then you you know then have to just keep putting more stuff on and it becomes a much more expensive enterprise just uh, just one thing um i mean basically what you're saying is chemical fertilizers are, are masking the problem of degraded soils but i just want to if you may just explain a little bit more about the relation uh, between carbon or carbon dioxide and soil uh, because you mentioned that carbon is released from the soil but for a lot of our listeners who perhaps don't understand the whole cycle of how uh, carbon dioxide is drawn out of the um, you know out of the atmosphere and how important the soil is you know everyone thinks it's the trees but how much the soil actually plays an important role and then why the carbon's released back into into the atmosphere do you want to just explain a little bit uh you know a little bit more detail sure. there so it all starts with photosynthesis so plants use sunlight as energy to take carbon dioxide out of the air and along with water they'll make sugars and they use that so it's taking solar energy and turning it into chemical energy in the form of sugar just like you know you have a great big hit of sugar you're full of energy right it's because that sugar is containing chemical energy now, the sugar is made up of bits of carbon, right? That's the bit that they take out of the carbon dioxide. So they suck it in from the air. They'll use that carbon from the CO2. They'll take the C 
and they'll join it all together. They get rid of the O2, which is a really handy byproduct for us, um, a handy waste plant waste product, which we use. Yeah. Um, and the carbon bit they use to make sugars, and that, of course, they can use to build more plant, uh, do all kinds of processes within the plant to keep themselves healthy and growing and reproducing and all this sort of stuff. But then also, and this is the really key part of it all, is that some of those sugars they will then send down through their root system and they will exude it to, they will put it out and exchange it. They'll use it like a currency with other organisms, right? And these are the microbes. And when we say microbes, we're talking about bacteria, fungi, archaea, other little things, little critters that live in the ground. And this is fundamentally the basis for not only how regenerative agriculture functions, but of course, it's how terrestrial ecosystems function. Because plants are basically, in an evolutionary sense, the result of algae and fungi cooperating or exploiting each other, depending upon how you want to think about it. Mm. But essentially, plants were just algae in, in the water, and then they got onto land, and then they been so successful because they have worked in symbiosis in partnership with these microbes over hundreds of millions of years so when we talk about natural uh, nutrient cycling or fertility cycling that, that's what we're talking about we're talking about this living ecosystem under the ground and how it connects with the living ecosystem above the ground so we go back to the plant it's got its sugar it's putting it out through the roots and it's exchanging it with different microbes and it could be a, a fungus where what we might call a, a mycorrhizal fungus one that associates with roots and if you can imagine what little um, roots are like spreading out through the ground the the fungus the fungi attaches to these roots sometimes inside sometimes around but then it, it itself has these little hyphae we call them like little tendrils little um, root-like appendages out throughout the soil giving it a massive, extending the root area of the plant by a massive amount, which allows the plant to access nutrients and water that it wouldn't otherwise be able to. There are also bacteria and other things in there doing all kinds of interesting jobs. Um, and the plant uses those sugars in exchange for things that it needs. And it does this real time, all the time, in the amounts that it requires. So the plant is looking after its own nutrition. Um, and we could talk about that for ages, and it's really fascinating and really interesting. No, I think, I think that's really sort of hit a key note here, is that carbon dioxide or carbon is not necessarily an awful thing in the world oh, because no. it it's is It's what something... we were made out of. It's Correct. Necessary. And it, it yeah. drives everything. And I think that's an important message, yeah. that you know, people the hear the word is... carbon, it's like, you know. Yeah, the problem is just it's in the wrong place. Yeah. Mm. You yeah. know, it's not that it's a bad thing, it's just... We've got too much of it in the wrong place. And, you know, what I wanted to sort of point out was that the carbon gets stored. And so some of the carbon gets recycled and then gets um, breathed out, as it were, just like we do. It gets respired by other organisms. But when you have healthy soils, you get quite a lot of it, which gets incorporated into essentially the soil structure, right? The, the, the yeah. organic matter in the soil is all made up of carbon and some forms of that are incredibly stable and, and you can actually build it up over time. So soils can be rebuilt and they can get deeper. And basically what you're getting when you get deeper soils is, is deeper carbon storage. And that, that is the key bit which underpins what we're doing in regenerative agriculture. So we're not, I would argue that we're not necessarily doing it to store carbon per se. Some are maybe, but that's not really, I would argue that's not really the point. Because I would say that even if we didn't have a climate crisis or a carbon crisis, we would still need to be doing this. The fact that we can sequester vast amounts of carbon doing it is a huge bonus. Um, but it's not the only reason to do it. Uh, it's, but it is really important. The key reason so to do it is because it will feed us forever and we can do it in a way that allows us to produce food while also supporting biodiversity and restoring ecosystems. Like, that's the reason to do it. Uh, that will allow us to feed ourselves forever without degrading the, the resource. It just so happens that, that by doing that, we can be undoing a lot of the awful stuff we've done over the last 250 years to our soils or longer. Yeah. So, so what are the key principles to regenerative agriculture? How do we restore our soil health? Well, um, 
where to it, start. <laughs> well played, Emma. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know what? Look, I think depending upon who you're talking to or, or what exactly your frame of reference is, you know, you can adopt different principles. Um, if you're talking just about grazing and about soils, then, you know, the important principles are, are things like always keep the ground covered, always have a living root um, and so forth. I actually like to think about it a bit more broadly than that, though, um, in so far as I think that we need to be not just looking at how we manage our activities on the land. I mean, that's hugely important, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying that I think that we also need to be looking more broadly at the entire ecosystem that we're a part of. So looking at it from a landscape perspective as well. So um, I would say that the the key to the, the regenerative agriculture approach is to really understand where you are and what yeah what is that context what is that landscape you know and part of that is is not just the physical landscape but also the social or psychological landscape of where you're operating um but primarily of course we do need to be paying attention to the physical landscape and understand what's the climate you know what is the what is the topography you know what is the rainfall here what is all this sort of stuff so in other words you can summarize that i guess into a principle of know where you are understand your context Diversity is the other thing that's really important here, is we get resilience through diversity. It's the same if you're talking about your stock portfolio or your farm. At the end of the day, if you go all in on one thing, your risk uh, of something happening is, is much higher. So we, the more diversity we have, the more resilience we have in our landscape. And that's resilience to changes in climate, you know, or, or weather events um, to to anything. I mean, it gives us resilience to, in fact, here's a good example. So say, you know, if you're a, a, um, a dairy farmer and you that's all you're doing on your land and you are financially very dependent upon the price of milk or milk solids or you know, milk powder, depending upon what, how you're operating and what market you're in. Um, so what we're talking about is by thinking about diversity, we're saying, well, an alternative is a farm that doesn't just produce milk. And so it's not just concerned with pasture and cows and, and getting milk out of that system. It may also be growing nut crops. Uh, it may also have a market garden on there, maybe producing honey or you know, may also have pigs, chickens, may have eggs, you know, so on and so forth. The point is, is that by diversifying the landscape use, you can diversify what you're doing economically, um, which gives you greater resilience. And it just so happens that that aligns really well with what the kind of the landscape wants to do. You know, you don't have monocultures, you don't just have one single species um, in nature that basically never happens. So what we're doing is we're mimicking natural ecosystems to restore function. You know, the more species you've got going on there, the more more things that can be done because each of those species will have its own little way of going, but just like people, they're, they're all sort of individual, they've got their own ways of doing things, they all perform different roles. Um, and the more you have in there, the better off that landscape the healthier the landscape can be. I think when we look at, um, in particular, Australia more so than in New Zealand, but New Zealand's also got its own issues, especially with winter grazing. But in Australia, with the ongoing uh, significant amount of deforestation um, resulting from that in, in many parts, uh, the desert desertification, um, so, you know, a lot of that topsoil gone, um, and which means can't retain water, it's lost a lot of the nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's, you know... If we diversify and say, well, we won't, we won't just have cattle, we'll have pigs or sheep, well, that's not really addressing the issue. I mean, what you've said is, you know, covering the soil is, is where we need to be. It needs to, you know, we need to, to cover it with some form of vegetation which allows to re, I guess, reintroduce 
nutrients back into the into the into the soil or, or, or regenerate the soil basically that's really yeah, what we want to get to yeah. so what so what you know when we talk about regenerative regenerative agriculture um what because when you presented you showed there were different forms of it you know whether it's layering different types of uh you know plants in terms of crops um having uh, grazers mixed in there as well so there's still that whole interaction of of uh, breaking seeds, trampling on the soil, spreading manure, things like that. I mean, and, but that also necessarily doesn't have to be part of the solution. So, what what are different approaches that can break away from that very industrialized uh, land, or you know, very heavy, intensified farming, uh, the winter grazing, which we know can be quite destructive, especially to our waterways. What are some of the key sort of aspects we can look at, or, or you know, for, in terms of regenerative? agriculture yeah well i mean i think um you, you you raise a really good point australia you know it's got a very diverse landscape but often in australia uh your problem is water or it, it, it involves not having enough of it or when you do get it not being able to take advantage of it because mm. it's not soaking in or when you do get too much of it it's carrying half your topsoil away or you know so or it's or you've got dry land salinity problems where you know you inappropriate water and irrigation management drawing salt up from lower down in, in the soil profile and so on and so forth so you know again this comes back to this what i was talking before about understand your context you know what what you would would do in one area you wouldn't just go and stamp on again you know mm. in another place so you really need to understand what you're up against what your context is um but in terms of what are the different forms that it can take i mean you can you, you know, you, I guess you would commonly see everything from a grazing pasture system um, with, with ruminant animals, um, but with very diverse pastures that may include, you know, flowers and vegetables and other things and, and various other, you know, what you might call non-traditional or non what, the, what you wouldn't expect to see, non-traditional species mm. integrated into those pastures and the animals are moved very frequently um, to allow very long rest times for any one patch, um, which is a way of mimicking the way that wild um, ruminants would move across the African savanna, um, you know, with, with predators constantly on their heels, keeping them bunched together and moving regularly. Um, that is a, is, is, a, is a common feature of regenerative systems. Um, you would see um, other systems that would look different to that, that are agroforestry systems. And what that means is it's basically where you are incorporating um, some form of agricultural cropping with forestry. And um, one of the common ways that that manifests is in alley cropping systems. So you'll find that you'll get a, a big row of um, trees and then... Uh, depending upon how it's been done, you know, you may then underneath that have some sort of lower trees that grow that naturally grow smaller, and then under that you may have some shrubs, and then something else under that, and then you'll have a lane way where you might have um, uh, crops, annual crops or perennial crops, um, and then uh, some of those laneways may also have grazing animals in them, um, which are rotated through uh, and so forth. And the other thing you can also find is uh, silver pasture systems, which is uh, similar. Uh, to agroforestry, but you would tend to have uh, sort of trees, individual trees spread out a bit more widely spaced with grass growing in between. And then you, so that's sort of mimicking a sort of more open forest savanna type system. And this is actually um, a, a classic example of that is the um, Dehesa of um, Spain, where the famous Hamon Iberico is produced. Um, if you've ever had that sort of Spanish cured ham it's really delicious it also sells for thousands of euros if you get the really good stuff um, yeah so that's produced in those systems and they've been running for hundreds and hundreds of years um, sustainably you know they support um, Iberian lynx and eagles and all kinds of you know higher level predators all the way down um, and they also have uh, cork oak and so they harvest cork and other things from that system they have um, vegetables and various other things so so what you're seeing is you're seeing this diversity in action and you're seeing this kind of layering 
of different activities. Now, this is, of course, not always necessarily done by just the same like, one farmer. It's not necessarily one farmer doing 12 things or whatever. You may have overlap of people running different enterprises off the same patch of land at different times of year. But the point being is that the, all these systems are designed, I guess, with an eye to what is the ecosystem I'm in? How, how can I be deriving a livelihood from being a guardian or a steward of this land? You know, how can I be doing what makes this land healthy, what, what keeps its health going and improving it, um, while also generating some sort of livelihood from it? Um, so that's what they all have in common. Um, you know, some areas are naturally grasslands and, and be managed as such regeneratively forever. Um, others are perhaps more inclined towards being forest-like systems, and so they will be married. Um, they will be managed more like that. Um, so, to the uninitiated, yeah, you may see you may see these different kind of land use patterns uh, depending upon on where they're at. And in, in some cases, you'll actually see places um, where you have all those things in different parts uh, of the landscape. So, regenerative agriculture is different from the way that we usually do things because we are shifting from imposing simplicity onto the landscape to managing the complexity that's already there. We Or that should be there. Are trying, or that should be there, yeah. The, the complexity that exists in nature. So we, we want to manage that. We want to embrace it. And essentially, I like to think of it as a kind of a, a process of waking up and kind of realising that we, we live in a complex world and that to, to, to sort of act otherwise is a bit of a delusion, really frankly. Waste, for example, I mean, that's a human invention. There, there's no such thing as waste in nature. Natural systems operate in sort of closed loops. You know, the, the output of one thing becomes the input of another. And that sort of is true across all kinds of different scales. So when we are designing and managing our activity on the landscape and regenerative agriculture, we are trying to find ways to close those loops back up. We are always trying to embrace that complexity that exists in, in natural systems, um, and especially as we start to see the land regenerate, you will see more diversity, you'll see more complex interactions between different things. And in some ways, it's, it's, it's hubris to think that we can fully understand all of that and sort of almost hold it all within our heads. But that's not really what you need to do. What you need to do is, be, is really good at observing and being considered and thoughtful about how you are managing that landscape so that you are observing how things are connected, how the, how when you act or when you change something, what the effects are, and then you adjust accordingly. And that's the other really, I think, probably key thing about regenerative agriculture is that it's not static. It isn't a set process that you apply to the land. It's an approach. It's a mindset. Um, you try all kinds of different things. And, and, you know, I think because, you know, many pioneers have, have shown how it can be done successfully, we imitate some of those basic principles of how you do things, but we always tailor it to where we are. Um, and we observe and we say, okay, well, you know, in this particular context, you know, actually that doesn't work so well as that. And so when we do that, this happens and that's good and all that wasn't so good. So next time we do that, we're going to, you know, and so this never stops. You are constantly adjusting, constantly. It's a dynamic environment, basically. Yeah, that's it, because the environment's never the same. Yeah. And, and so we're, we're, it's growing, we're growing with it, and we're on a, in a kind of a dance together. And the other thing, I suppose, is also having a bit of an awareness of pattern. So instead of, like I said before, taking an industrial, simplified, you know, mechanistic um industrial pattern and imposing that we look to what are the patterns that are naturally found in the natural world you know what are the patterns we find out there in the world and when you start to look for them you start to see them everywhere you know and it can be something just as simple as you know the pattern of how branches and trees form the dendritic pattern is the same as how nerves in our bodies form or when you look at river systems from satellites it's all the same pattern so why is that? It's not an accident. You know, I like to say this is 3.8 billion years of R&D that nature's been doing, and it has come to these solutions time and time again because they work. So, again, it's, it's about sort of opening up, opening our eyes and seeing what's around us rather than closing off 
and sort of putting our head down, eyes down, and just trying to sort of bullheadedly enforce something onto the land, you know, trying to force it to work. And in some ways, we've gotten away with that because we've had 250 odd years of fossil fuels, right? We had the energy to, to force it to our will, but we won't have that anymore. So it's not just that doing this is a kind of a nice eco greeny tree hugger thing to do. This is actually about our survival. This is about being grown ups and recognizing that we've blown our inheritance. We've been spending beyond mm. what we've been earning from an energy perspective, right? Um, we've been like trust fund babies, you know, and if you think about it, before we discovered fossil fuels, we had to live within our energy means. You know, we had solar energy, which falls on the earth, and to some degree, wind energy uh, is solar energy from a certain perspective. Um, but that's, that's basically it. The only energy input we have, more or less, is the sun. That drives everything. Drives, makes plants grow. They make the chemical energy. We eat the plants. The animals eat the plants. We eat the animals and so on and so forth. So that's what drives the whole system, right? That was the only energy we had. And everything we did had to live and operate, function within that budget. So what we've got now is a situation where we discovered fossil fuels, which is simply just that same photosynthetic energy, that same plant energy, which instead of decomposing, got stored underground and fossilised. And we've dug it up. So it's like a big savings, like if someone's buried a big pot of gold. We just dug it up and we've gone, oh, fantastic. And we've had this wild party and it's driven like this massive expansion of civilization and, you know, technology and all that stuff. And, you know, it's great. We've, we've done all kinds of amazing things with it. But we've kind of forgotten that it was a one-off. It was just an inheritance. And we've burned through it. And, of course, it's also managed to sort of trash the planet to a large degree. But even if it hadn't have done that, the fact is it was never going to last forever anyway. So at a certain point, we we're always going to have to say, okay, let's get real, let's grow up, and let's live within our budget. Let's live within our energy means again. So that's what, from a food-producing perspective, that's what regenerative agriculture is doing, is it's offering us a way, in fact, to be honest with you, I think it's the only way we know of, of how we can produce food to feed people within that energy budget forever. And that's the key thing. It has to be forever. If it only works for 100 years, then what happens then? We all just keel over and die or we have to genetically engineer ourselves to live off air? I mean, you know, like the, nobody sort of thinks it through. So to me, the, the only answer that's good enough is one that allows us to do it forever because anything else is just kicking the can down the road as far as I'm concerned. Now, I just want to take a step back, if if I may. Um, yeah. You mentioned before the use of animals. So holistic grazing is a bit of a buzz mm -hmm. topic at the moment and it's yeah. kind of being held up as, you know, like the answer to uh, the current industrial factory farming system. Um, but I just maybe want to get your opinion on this because from the reading that I've done, I don't see it as a one-for-one -one kind of replacement. Current livestock numbers absolutely dwarf what the natural populations would be that, you know, preceded them. So ultimately regenerative ag um, will still require a reduction in meat consumption and a shift towards plant-based diets. Do you, do you see it that way? In a word, yes. The, the, long, the long and short of it is that we need to be eating a lot less meat. I think from the, the education that I've had, the research that I've done, it's, you know, for health reasons, um, but also, of course, for planetary reasons. We just need a lot fewer animals, like, we need a lot fewer animals, a lot fewer livestock. I think that's not the right way to put it. We, we need to be producing, no, what's the right way to put it? it sounds doesn't sound right when I say we need a lot fewer livestock. Um, we, need, we, need, we need a lot less. Uh, livestock, absolutely. Um, if I recall, if you're looking at all the biomass of mammals on the planet, 60% of them are livestock, 36% are humans, and 4% are wild animals. That is not right. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We need to be eating a lot less meat. Where we are producing meat, and that's, and that's the key distinction. So in this model looking forwards of where we need to be or want to be managing livestock. Where that happens, 
the best way to do it is through holistic plant grazing things. Um, so the question of can you restore grasslands through grazing animals? Absolutely you can. It's been shown that you can do that. And there's, you know, really good sound ecological reasons sort of as to why that works and why that's a good thing. But, of course, there's always going to be a tension of, well, okay, some of those places where we are grazing animals should be restored to native savannas. With native species doing that, with native predators moving them and so on and so forth, right? But in some ways, that challenge is at least as much a socio-political one as anything else. Um, so what I'm not suggesting is that the way to solve the environmental problems we have is to convert everything into grazing lands. That is not what I'm saying, and that is definitely not what I agree with. That's not my position. The way I look at it is that, and this actually is something interesting that I heard um, David Holmgren, the, the co-founder of Permaculture, talking about recently, was that in the initiating conversation he had with Bill Mollison, um, and when, just as they were coming up with the idea of, of permaculture, um, is that Bill Mollison said, who asked the question, if nature's way of optimising energy use is to be a forest where conditions allow, right? So given enough rainfall and all the other things that it needs, nature tends towards becoming a forest. If that's the optimal way, then why doesn't our agriculture look like that? Or if, if not even look like that, why doesn't it at least function like a forest? And I just think that's a brilliant question. And so when I think about what the, the model for, you know, if we have this idealised permanent food system that supports biodiversity and feeds humanity, et cetera, and restores water cycles, what that kind of looks like, I think that in a lot of places that looks more like a forest, or at least it has many more trees in it than it does now, let's put it that way. It doesn't always look like a, like a no, I don't mean a closed canopy forest, but what I mean is that, you know, the forest is a spectrum. So some of them are more sort of open forests with trees spread out. Some of them are more dense. Some of them, you know, like we talked about, you might find a sort of an agroforestry thing where you're talking in, in rows and you can be having crops underneath that need lots of sun. And there's lots of different ways to approach this. But I think that there are very few grazing landscapes that wouldn't benefit from more trees in them and that they that don't wouldn't benefit from a shift away from just solely grazing to more small integrated land use um and i think that you know there's lots of evidence to suggest that that's actually you know a really positive direction to go just to um throw a different angle on this you know we talk about holistic grazing as a sustainable way for the current for now you know as in this is how we should be doing it. However, what about the fact that, as you've mentioned, we've been living like fun babies. We've created a um, we've created a bigger problem that is not just about reducing carbon emissions now and saying, okay, that's going to be sustainable for the future. There's now the concept of the legacy load of carbon. So oh. just changing away to make the now better is actually not enough. We've also got to make up for the damage we've caused in the last, what, 40, 50 years of this shift of industrialized uh, agriculture. So do we not need to go more extreme to get back to where we should be to then find that balance? Yeah. So, and so this is a really interesting question. I think that in all of this, there is a kind of a balance between identifying a kind of goal for where what you know the direction we need to be heading in you know and that's like what i've been talking about the sort of more idealized set of principles or you know whatever you want to call it a kind of a picture a vision of mm -hmm. what a sustain truly sustainable food system might look like and but recognizing that we're not there today but understanding the kinds of things that should be in it or need to be in it or can't be in it so that we can make an informed decision about what direction we head in today then there's the question of 
well, how do we get there, right? And, and what are the sort of sensible steps to take? And this is where I think that things like holistic plant grazing play a really a much bigger role because if you if someone's grazing right now, then there's a good chance that what they're doing probably isn't that sustainable. Now, the point to make here is that ecosystems are never static. So they are either regenerating naturally or they're being degraded. That can happen quickly or it can happen slowly, but it's never stays still. So you could say, oh, yeah, but what we're doing now isn't that bad. You know, we've been doing it for 100 years. And it's like, okay, yeah, that, that's true. But is it getting better over that 100 years or is it getting slightly worse, right? And most people don't tend to think along those lines. So they can sometimes believe that what they're doing isn't a problem just because it may be degrading at, at a rate which is not on their own time scale. So the reason why that's important is because when we're talking about, okay, well, we've got grazing land now, we need to be switching it towards a way of managing that will actually make sure it's regenerative. Right? We know that it's easier to point out the ones that are just trashing it at lightning speed. Um, but then the closer you get towards the sort of very slow end of things, the harder it sometimes can be to, to say, oh, they, they should probably shift. Um, and arguably they're the least urgent ones maybe. But nevertheless, um, where you're grazing animals, holistic plan grazing is the best way that we know how to regenerate soils, build soils and lock away carbon. And that is um, and obviously combined with really good biological soil management, which is which is part of that. I, I see it as part of that picture. Um, because what you're doing is you're using the animals as in a natural system, as a form of disturbance, which is to eat grass, which then prompts the grass to regrow, which is regeneration. And then as long as there is sufficient rest time, you, you can have a net benefit where the, the roots get deeper, the soil gets built, the microbes come back, it holds more water, which allows the plant to grow better, which helps build biomass, which allows them for more grass, which allows for those herbivores to have something to eat, and you never need to you never require any inputs. It's it is it was regenerative. You can actually regenerate a landscape doing this, as has been demonstrated in many places. And and so therefore, as a kind of sort of short to medium term carbon sequestration tool. It's very strong. But and forests could be more impactful, couldn't they? I mean, if we well, look at how much no, okay. land is being is being used for grazing, what if we took a portion of that? So we're not saying let's get rid of, okay. of, of, of you know, grazing. There's, there's, there's two things here. <laughs> yeah. One, there's, there's complicated carbon accounting, some of which I, I think is – it's a bit questionable. In so far as okay, when you are counting carbon, I mean not to get into the detail of this. Oh, but, I'm not talking about pine forests. I'm talking about no, 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 reintroducing just, I'm talking native forests. Just, just the difference between soils and trees. Yeah, when you yeah. are counting carbon, usually, like often what I've seen is that the kind of accounting that they're doing takes models from forestry, which is only usually concerned with the above ground portion of the tree, not the roots and yeah, not anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that being said. There are also much better models in use, which do take into account, but they make an assumption. Okay, yeah. how big is the root system? Now, my question is, do we really know in a lot of cases? And where we think we know is that based on plantations, where we get often underdeveloped root systems or only a very select number of trees, species, versus natural systems and so on and so forth. Is that counting root exudates that plants are putting out, which is also carbon? What is you know what does that translate to in terms of microbial biomass and the carbon accounted for in that? Blah, 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 blah. It gets really complicated. Mm. So I try to stay away from all that stuff as much as I can um, and simply say, why not have both? So let's, how many trees can you put into a grazing landscape, right, before it starts to affect the grass productivity. Now, in some cases, numbers that I've heard thrown around is 30% canopy cover before you start getting. So already that's without even changing, without even telling anyone you can't graze anything. You just, you can get 
a significant number of trees onto those landscapes already. Now, to me, that's already a win-win, right? Mm. No one's losing anything there. Everyone's winning at that point. Um, clearly, though, if you can actually get better production, if, just from a grazing point of view, if you can get better production and better health um, off a smaller piece of land or at least a less intensively managed piece of land, um, that means you can also start to retire more of that into native um, or, you know, regenerate in sort of more rewilding type place, which allows more, you know, sort of conservation outcomes from that um, and so on and so forth. So I kind of don't even like to talk about trees or grazing. I try and say let's do trees and grazing. Um, but, yes, but definitely more trees, like, you know, we, I think we can, and I think that, that what you probably tend to find is that as you increase the trees and you then increase as well the potential for other income streams, the need to rely on having as bigger herds of livestock reduces. And then their role starts to become how can they enhance the system rather than how can I make the most money out of them, right? Because if your only job is to make as much money as you can from grass and cattle then it's in your interest to make everything about grass and and livestock right yeah. but then when your objectives shift towards how can i make this the most resilient healthy diverse system that i can of course i get economic benefits from doing that as well then the equation shifts and you, you don't necessarily need the same numbers anymore so i think that there's lots of potential benefits that that can be had through going down this path without but before you even get to a kind of a contest between grazing or not grazing on the existing grazing things does that does that make sense a hundred percent hundred percent yeah yeah it's um, it's it's like you say it goes back to achieving a balance time and place of where you are because depending whether you're in New Zealand, Australia, and Africa, and the Americas, you know it's all circumstantial, and and you've got to yeah. you've got to work in with what's what's around you. To put it to flip it around, if yeah. the only way we could do it was to have a conversation where we have to go around to sixty percent of people grazing and say stop grazing and plant trees, I would say that's a dead end. Sure, that's, that's a that's no, a lose, and that's lose. that's not sustainable. Yeah, it needs for... to be stepping stones. Correct, yeah. correct. Um, a quote of yours now please correct me if i got this completely wrong because this is me taking notes in the dark when when you know when you're presenting but you said we owe our existence to a thin layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains is that right did you say that (laughs) and i absolutely love that quote now that's a little lead into a documentary on netflix that has just very recently been um released called kiss the ground um, which uh, basically it's all about the soil, isn't it? Now, any any key outtakes on that? Is it worth the watch? Is it uh, is it a lot of greenwashing? Do you think there's a lot of truth? Do you think there's good hope? Any, any you know, just very high level. Yeah, I think it's a great film. Um, I was really pleased. I've seen quite a few documentaries uh, in this space over the years, and I'd say this definitely stands out as being one of the best um, for sure. Um, what I loved about it was that it, you know, really highlighted how important soil is, um, the fact that it's living, um, which seems obvious to some, but it is not obvious to most. Um, it's a living ecosystem and it really does underpin everything. I mean, literally everything. Our entire civilization is dependent upon it. Without living soil, um, you know, we, we don't have a future. So, I thought it was really good, and I highly recommend it to anyone that's entertaining as well. Didn't get too technical, but um, was detailed enough that you can sort of get a picture and an understanding of what's going on and why it matters, but um, not so detailed that it gets dense um, or requires a sort of degree in it. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was really good. And, and again, it sort of also echoes, um, or maybe it just sort of fits in really nicely with the sort of approach that I take when I try and talk to people about this stuff and say, look, you know, there are loads of different methodologies out there when we're talking about how we can work with land, you know, permaculture design, you know, we've talked about agroforestry, silver pasture, holistic plant grazing, centropic agroforestry, agroecology, pasture cropping, key lime, FMNR, um, natural sequence farming, all this stuff, and it's all great. The 
the thing which I think kind of underpins all of it or is a really critical factor, the base of the pyramid, is looking after soil. It is, it is the biological management of soil. Um, it's looking after that natural soil ecosystem, um, which we are learning more and more about all the time. Um, so, yeah, it's absolutely critical. And just very quickly, because um, I am mindful that we've kept you for a while, <laughs> um, we like to give some, you know, take-home messages to our listeners on how they can take action, not just, you know, listen to the gems that you've shared. Um, so any tips for, you know, the home gardener or someone who's got a hobby farm, how they can make that more sustainable? Well, Again, where to start? <laughs> <laughs> where to start? <laughs> and to our listeners, um, we're actually seeing Shane sit in his chair really thinking hard about this one. <laughs> look, I think the key thing is start with the soil. You know, recognise that your soil is living. The great thing about the internet that we all know is that there's just loads of information out there. Sure, not all of it's top-notch, but, but a lot of great information is out there. Um, you know, I would start there i would say if you're working um at a small scale you know really observe pay attention challenge your assumptions you know i, I hear a lot especially um gardening and horticulture and stuff i've often heard a lot of people say oh you know you can't do that or that won't work or um you know this sort of received wisdom and some of it's fair enough but not all of it is uh, and i've often been um fascinated by the results that I've gotten. Sometimes you know, something won't work and I'll think, oh, maybe that's died. Maybe I just made a huge mistake there. But actually I'll wait and I'll give it time and I'll actually find that, you know, it all it comes good or it, things turn around, um, you know. So my advice would be recognise that you're operating in a living system. So, you know, do the best you can to learn about that and learn about what's actually going on. And then you tend to find that you can work with it rather than against it, and that makes your job easier when you're trying to grow things. You know, plants want to grow. The, the, you know, sort of our job is to just sort of get out of the way sometimes and just sort of help, assist, you know, remove some of the roadblocks. Um, and a key part of that, I think, is, is, is helping ensure that the soil is healthy. If, if you're doing, if you're working on a larger piece of land, um, you know, do a permaculture course, you know. That's a really good way of, of understanding, I think, how important design can be and thinking about all the different elements that you are dealing with and how to connect them, how to sort of, yeah, embrace that complexity. I think permaculture design can be a really good way of doing that. Well, that's that's a super strong finish. Thank you, Shane. Now, hopefully my editing skills are top notch and we'll hide the fact that we had to start this conversation about three times. We've had water blasters in the background where Shane lives, his internet cut out, then Emma's mic cut out. Lots of dramas, but this has been really, really good. And another quote of yours, Shane, and I hope I got this one right as well, is you said that farmers are ecosystem managers. And I'd actually like to change the one word and say rather than farmers, we should all be ecosystem managers. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can all do our bit. So whether we have a massive piece of land providing for a community or population or if we're at home and starting with composting and and adding to to the soil and and so on but just taking care and being aware some really key important messages some good discussion um you know i think the documentary is really worth watching kiss kiss the ground we'll put a link to that in our show notes as well we'll link to the brilliant actionecology.com website um shane thank you so much for your time we really appreciate it Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. If you found this interesting, make sure you subscribe and share it with your friends. 